Our Old Testament reading is from the prophet Isaiah. I'm going to read to you from the 35th chapter, the first 10 verses. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice with blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst forth into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. God will come with vengeance and with divine retribution. God will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout with joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling up springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it, it will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ferocious beast will get up in it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And the ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing, Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will be no more. Here is God's word to us. Thanks be to God. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Everlasting joy will be upon their heads. They shall have joy and gladness. Those are strange words in the context that they come from. We read them and we like the sounds of them. They resonate with us as people, but when you think about how they came forth, they're astounding kinds of words that people in those circumstances would respond with joy and trust and believe in the goodness of God is not an, always an easy thing to do, but it certainly is the message of Christmas. I want to take just a moment and talk a little bit about the context in which those um, passages were given. Isaiah was writing to the people of Israel in that time in which the Assyrians had invaded and conquered that whole region. It took place in about 742 B.C. The armies laid waste to the land. There was great destruction. The people were taken off into exile. Many of them were killed. Many of them were turned into slaves. Israel at that time was not a shining star. They had become disloyal to God. Uh, there was social injustice. The wealthy ruled everyone and the poor seemed powerless. And in many ways, their culture and their time was not that different from what is being expressed in our culture and in our time both in our country and certainly around the world. We talk about forces coming in and brutalizing people and people dying and innocent children being displaced and going into exile. And we can talk about Aleppo in Syria. We talk about people feeling weak and powerless and that the wealthy become stronger 
and we can talk about things happening in our own country. But in the midst of that, the word of the Lord comes through Isaiah. And I think in the midst of our circumstances, the word of the Lord comes to us today. And it's a word of hope, it's a word of joy, and it's a word of gladness. And it doesn't come because of the world in which people live. It comes because of the grace and goodness of God. And the gospel message, the word of God, is always one of hope. It is always one of goodness. It is always one of joy. And it is always one that says that the darkness shall not overcome the light because the light of life and all people has come into our world. Mary's response of joy, saying, my soul gives glory to God, to me I find even more strange. We know the context, and yet we've so romanticized it that it's important for us to remember what was happening in the life of this young, unwed woman. Because of what was happening and this strange message she got from God, she faced the potential of being ostracized from her community, being seen as unclean, of not being able to be a part of the community and looked down upon. She was hopeless and she was powerless. And it says that as soon as she understood the circumstances that she was in, she went to the hill country to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And I think what Elizabeth said to her was what gave her joy was what set her free, is what opened up the possibility for this young woman to say, my soul glorifies God. So what did Elizabeth say to her? Elizabeth said, you are blessed, and your child is blessed. And I am blessed that you would come and be with me. God is going to do something wonderful in your life. Now that's all we have, but that's a pretty good summary. For a person who was seen as unclean, insignificant, unimportant, Elizabeth, as the scripture says, was filled with the Holy Spirit and said, No, you're not unclean or unimportant. You are blessed, and blessed is the child that is in you, and blessed am I to get to be with you, and blessed are you who will believe in that word of God. And in that, she was set free to find joy. That is the word of God proclaimed through a woman to another woman. And in that word, this young woman finds hope and possibilities and opportunity and the strength to say, my soul glorifies God. Think of what she could have said in her circumstances. Everything is stacked against me. Life is no good. I don't like this. I have no hope. But something within her rises up in response to Elizabeth and says, My soul glorifies the Lord. I was thinking about this and thinking about it in relation to one of the passages of Scripture that um, we preached on and, and we read in our worship services the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And it's the passage out of Philippians, the fourth chapter, um, beginning with verse 4 through verse 8. And I want to read it to you again and relate it to what I think just took place in that conversation between Elizabeth and Mary. So you'll remember this uh, passage. Rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all that the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, 
But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will fill your heart and your mind. Now, I think in that passage, we're being given a spiritual practice. Rejoice and give thanks and offer our prayers to God. Now, that's a choice that we make about life because we believe that life is good and that God is with us and the goodness of God shall overcome all circumstances and always give us possibilities. So we choose to rejoice, to believe, to give thanks. And then he goes on and he says, and finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. You see what Elizabeth did? She said to Mary, Mary, life doesn't look too good right now. But I want you to think about the goodness of God. I want you to think about those things that are good and noble and right and pure and holy. And fill your mind and your attitudes and your thoughts with those things and you will find joy and peace and comfort that passes all human understanding. You see, the words that Elizabeth spoke to Mary make a difference, made a difference. And you and I need to understand that the words we speak make a difference. Do we speak hope? Do we speak light and life? Or do we speak words that are negative and down? It's so easy for us to think about all the things that are wrong in the world, and it's more difficult for us to think about all the things that are right in the world. Every day, in every place, Millions of people are doing good, are loving, are sharing with neighbors, are giving of themselves, are working for justice, are overcoming evil, are teaching in schools, providing health care and support. And we can't forget that. Because if we do, the world seems hopeless and helpless. But the Christmas message is one of joy because God is with us. I remember the Sunday that I uh, preached on this biblical passage. I got up that morning and on the front page of the Statesman Journal was an article about a man who I failed to write down his name, but he volunteers for the, Red, uh, for the American Cancer Society in a program that's called Road to Recovery. And two days out of the week, he drives patients to their medical and doctor appointments. I've never met the man. He's doing that right here in our city, and it said that there are 50 others who do the same thing. That same week, I had a woman come into the church, and I happened to greet her in the hallway, and and I asked if she needed help with anything, and she said, well, I want to tell you about something I'm trying to do. And she's starting a program encouraging women to wear scarves, wherever you go, to wear scarves. Because she wanted, first of all, people who wear scarves because of their religious practices to know that there are other people who are willing to stand with them. And she wanted others to know that you can't categorize a person because they wear a scarf and so she was starting a movement in our community encouraging people to wear scarves i never met the woman before i may never meet her again but she's doing something to bring about good 
Last night I was at an event that is called Portland Sp Salem Speaks Up. And it was a group of people who are trying to make a difference in this community, activists, people who talked about caring for one another no matter what group of people we belong to or what classifications we fall under. And words of hope and goodness and kindness were being spoken. And folks, that's who we are. We're the people of light and life and hope. We're the people who practice that sense of speaking the words of truth, of reconciliation, of justice, of love to all people and to our world. We're the people of light who cannot be overcome by the darkness because God is with us. Emmanuel has come. I have good news of great joy. A Savior has been born. And Elizabeth said, Blessed is the one who will believe that. It's not always easy to believe. But we're the people who have committed our lives to follow the way of Jesus and to believe. May God give us grace in this season, in this time, and in this world to be people who glorify God and find the joy that comes by trusting in God's goodness. Amen.